So we are completing this month's segment of The Good Journey by taking a look once again at this theme of taking the journey in other people's shoes, seeking to understand life from other people's perspective. And so to that end, we have two texts today from the New Testament. The first from perhaps an unfamiliar part of the New Testament for many of us, the letter of Paul to Philemon, which is one chapter long and is a letter to a man named Philemon on behalf of a runaway slave named Onesimus. So hear the word of God. Beginning at verse 8, Paul writes, For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love, and I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him that is my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And then perhaps a very familiar story to most of us, that coming from the gospel according to John, the eighth chapter, beginning at the the first verse. While Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all people came to him and sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go on your way. And from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. By your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O Lord, that you allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, for we pray this in his name. Amen. <clears throat> When I was 14, my parents took our family on a trip to Europe, primarily to visit where my father had been stationed in Germany while he was in the army years before, but also to see other parts of the continent, including the beautiful city of London. And while we were in London, we were able to get tickets for Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap. Perhaps some of you have seen it, the longest running play in the history of London theater since 1952. It's a murder mystery with a plot too complicated to get into and an ending about which every audience is sworn to secrecy. 
Suffice it to say that it is a classic whodunit with a handful of characters stranded inside an inn during a snowstorm, each of them carrying enough suspicion in their character and story to be a prime suspect in an earlier murder. It is the forerunner of the murder mystery dinners that folks now host in their homes these days. It was a, a play with which, as a 14-year-old, I was transfixed because as the story developed, each of the characters appeared more and more guilty. You really were not sure who had done it of course, was Agatha Christie's gift, leaving us suspicion, lingering over each person in the story so as to make it a page turner and nail biter. There's nothing like reading or watching a good mystery. I know some of you are mystery readers. I've enjoyed some P.D. James and Dorothy Sayers and Dennis Lehane and especially our local and most famous mystery writer, the late John D. MacDonald, throw in a little Carl Hyacinth, and what you get are stories that employ our faculties to search for the dark and hidden side of each story's characters. Who could possibly have the motive, the ambition, the secret to hide, the questionable character, the chink in the armor, to have possibly done the heinous deed? And the longer the story goes, the more guilty everybody seems to be. Which, I wonder, if this isn't a little bit about what life is about. The longer the story goes, the more guilty everybody seems to be. Which is to say that your life, my life, has this way of throwing at us challenges and twists in the roads and hurdles to climb and difficult choices and painful circumstances to overcome, relationships we forged and abandoned, temptations we've resisted and not resisted, and through it all, none of us gets it perfectly right. I know that may come as a surprise to some of you. Our resume is mixed at best, a list of accomplishments over which we are justly proud, and a list of unfortunate decisions and actions that have revealed things about us about which we are less than proud. The longer the story goes, the more guilty everybody seems to be. And the world has its way of looking pretty harshly at the uneven resume that each of us presents. As much as we try to get it right, the world seems to focus in on what we've gotten wrong. Yeah, he's a good enough guy, but did you hear he lost his job last year? Yeah, she seems like a sweet person, but I, I think she's got a drinking problem. Yeah, she's a good student, but did you see what she was wearing yesterday? <laughs> yeah, he's pretty popular, but I, I think they're having money problems. The world has its way of running the scanner across our souls and our stories and shining that blue light on all the blemishes and the wounds and the chinks and the armor. To a baseball fan, you cannot mention the name Bill Buckner without an instant conjuring in the mind of the infamous extra inning World Series Game 6 losing error when Bill Buckner let a slow ground ball skirt between his legs, allowing the New York Mets to win the game and go on the next day to win the World Series. Buckner was vilified for the error, received regular death threats from crazy Red Sox fans. That's the first thing, though, you think of when you think of Bill Buckner. What is slow to come to mind is the National League Biden title that was his, his career 2,715 hits, more than Mickey Mantle and Ted Williams, 498 doubles and a batting average over 307 different seasons, not to mention his faithfulness to his marriage and being a good father to his three children. No. The scanner of world opinions scans his life and soul, and the light shines on one second. One second. Which may be the reality that Jesus is trying to address when he comes across the tribunal of self-appointed judges over the cowering woman who has made a serious, serious mistake. 
She has violated the law. She has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. She has been caught in adultery, been dragged before the town to be made a public spectacle. The last time I checked, it takes two to commit adultery, so we're not sure where the man is. <laughs> Someone has to be the scapegoat, and women were the easy target back then and even now a lot of the time. But there she is, and there her judges are, and they have the scanner. And this one's pretty easy to pick out. She has been caught. I should say they have been caught. And it doesn't matter what the rest of the resume says. This is who she is. Nothing else necessary to know. Pick up your stones, get ready to hurl, because she's booted the ground ball. She is nothing else in this story than the woman caught in adultery. My goodness, they don't even give her a name. And so as to get the rabbinical blessing for their cruel justice, the angry men ask Jesus if they aren't free and clear to make, to make this woman's life all about her mistake. Law says this is what we get to do, and Jesus says to them one of his most memorable lines, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her, which I guess is another way of saying any of you who wishes to have your life defined and your death defined by any one mess you've made, go right ahead, have at it. Which I guess is another way of saying that the new teaching by the new rabbi is to get into somebody else's shoes enough to see how badly we need mercy. That Jesus, the judge of all creation, the one who is the only right to pass sentence, Jesus is somehow able to look at this woman and see something that the scanner can't pick up. He sees the other side of the ledger. He sees what God saw in the beginning of creation, that God made the man and the woman. God made this woman, this woman, and God called her good. She has messed up, to be sure. She's hurt some people, but there's more to the story. There is a human being, the very creation of God, in need of a little bit of mercy, just like the rest of us. Just like the rest of us. Do I get an amen to that? Amen. Because you see, the pivot point of the gospel is this, that to put ourselves into other people's shoes starts with understanding your own shoes. And in your own shoes, Jesus says, guess what? You're not always the cat's meow. You're not entirely God's gift to the universe. You are not the complete package. You've got liabilities on your balance sheet. You stand in need of mercy, and somewhere along the way, you discovered that when Jesus ran the scanner across you, it didn't just turn up the scars and the wounds. It turned up something quite glorious, something He's willing to focus on beyond your mistakes, something that was there before the dawn of time. I suppose it's what Paul had in mind when he writes to his friend Philemon. Philemon has had a slave named Onesimus run away from his, state, his estate, and the law was pretty clear what happens to runaway slaves, the same things that happen to women and caught in adultery. But Paul has come to know Onesimus, and there's something more to the story about Onesimus than the headline, runaway slave. He's become, for Paul, a brother in Christ. So Paul writes to Philemon, the embittered owner, and says, I appeal to you, Philemon, on behalf of Onesimus. I appeal to you to see more in Onesimus than just the runaway slave. I appeal to you for this runaway slave as a brother in Christ, a beloved brother in Christ. I appeal to you to see in this man what God saw in him before God even created him. I appeal to you to not make his mistake his headline. You see, here's the thing. In our judgments, in our convictions, in our convictions of other people, we enslave them, first of all. We enslave them to the servitude of our misinformed opinions. And we enslave them to a perspective 
unshared by Jesus. And we ens as we enslave them, we enslave ourselves. Those of you who have seen the movie Dead Man Walking know a little bit about the Catholic nun, Helen Prejean, who has spent most of her life ministering to and on behalf of death row inmates, not necessarily a feel-good ministry. You're ministering to people who have done very bad things and hurt and killed people. It all began when Sister Prejean was asked by a friend decades ago if she'd be willing to correspond by letter with a death row inmate in Louisiana. She agreed. And with each incoming and outgoing letter and with each subsequent visit that she made to this inmate, Elmo Patrick Sonier, she began to see and feel this soul inside him, a soul God had created. And she realized that that's what everybody forgot about when it came to people on death row, that these people had souls, that they were created by God, that they had some deep goodness in them before the dawn of time. So she made it her life to grant them the mercy of her letters and her visits, walking with them all the way to the electric chair. And she also began a ministry to those who were friends and family of those who had been killed by such death row inmates because they too have souls, they too need mercy. Creations of God in need of a little bit of mercy just like the rest of us. Says Sister Helen, people are more than the worst thing they've done in their lives. I talked to a pastor friend of mine a while ago who had been faithfully serving the same parish for over 20 years. It's a record when you get past 20 years in the parish. Over 20 years of baptizing babies, confirming children, burying their dead, visiting their sick, marrying the blissful, preaching the gospel. But toward the end of his tenure, a small group of people took exception to a sermon he preached and a buzz started through the congregation followed by an unfounded rumor. It wasn't long before emails landed in his inbox insisting upon his resignation, phone messages to elders demanding his firing. Over 20 years, baptizing, visiting, burying, preaching. Did any of that count, he asked me? You know, that side of the ledger? Well, of course it counts. The world is cruel with its scanner. Mercy comes usually only from those who walk in other people's shoes. For people are more than the worst thing they've done in their lives. In the story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, a little boy named Edmund, while in the land of Narnia, takes up alliances with the wicked witch. It's an awful mistake, and one he comes to regret before too long, but it's too late. She has enslaved him by the virtue of his big mistake. And because the law in Narnia is that once one becomes a traitor, they are subject to death, Edmund is sentenced to death. This law of retribution is what the Narnians call the deep magic, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But Aslan, the holy lion, steps forth and offers to die in the boy's place because what Aslan knows and what the wicked witch doesn't know is that there is a deeper magic, even deeper than the deep magic. A deeper magic than an eye for an eye, a deeper magic from before the dawn of time. And the deeper magic from before the dawn of time says that if someone is willing to sacrifice oneself for the treachery of another, then both are brought to life. If one is able to forgive the sin of another, both are brought to life. If someone is willing to put himself or herself into somebody else's shoes, then both can walk again. Aslan sacrifices himself, and as a result, both Aslan and Edmund are brought back to life. The deeper magic from before the dawn of time. I suppose in the biblical story we call this the Holy Spirit. 
the spirit who before the dawn of time hovered over the deep, the spirit who said, let there be light, the spirit who created the man and the woman and called them good, the spirit who spoke through the mouth of the rabbi and said to the woman, has no one condemned you? Neither do I. I bring you back to life. The spirit who stirred in the apostle and said, I appeal to you, Philemon, on behalf of Onesimus. I appeal to you on behalf of the deeper magic from before the dawn of time. I appeal to you for the good soul of your brother. I appeal to you for the same mercy that God has given you to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, as God in Christ also has forgiven you. For people are more than the worst thing they've done in their lives. This truth you shall know, and this truth shall set you free.